Okay, so next up, first afternoon session, we have Eric Waken from Columbia University, and he's going to talk about the Community Service Society Photographs project that he's been working on. Okay, um, thanks for coming out. I'm going to talk about a collaborative project that the library did working with a donor, the Community Service Society, and working with about five different um, units within the library to get a series of 1,500 photographs digitized and publicized. And I'll, I'll go into the details of a few things about how we do it. This is my agenda. I'll talk about what I think collaboration means, who the stakeholders are. I'll go through the photographs and why they're important, and I'll take you through the process we used together to get to the point where they're now going to be online soon for users. Um, I take collaboration to be people working together towards a common goal. I know there's a debate in librarianship about collaboration between two different institutions versus collaboration inside an institution. So this is to some extent probably 20% us and community service society and then maybe 80% the units within the library that work together to get this done. That by the way is a shot from the um, collection that's called Old Man's Toy Shop. Um, these are the stakeholders and I'll talk about them in a minute. So let's talk about what the photographs are, how they got to us before we get to what we're doing with them. Um, Community Service Society, let's get my notes up, um, is about 170 years old. They're a advocacy, um, direct service, social welfare agency in New York, a not-for-profit. In the last fiscal year, they had about $21 million in expenses, most gone out to serving poor people of color in New York. They were founded 170 years ago in two different um, iterations, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, one of the things they're known for is they effectively created this notion of social work. Columbia University's School of Social Work is derived from a school of social work they created. And one of the reasons we have the collection is because we got many social welfare collections to the School of Social Work, which came to the Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Columbia. Um, other things they've done historically in their earlier iterations are advocate for uh, tenement housing laws, school lunch programs, public health programs, and they continue to do that for different, different audiences today. Um, these are the precursor agencies for the Community Service Society. You can see what the first one is called, Association for Improving the Condition of the Poor. And these photographs in the collection were all um, created with the intent of advocating for poor New Yorkers. Um, the collection itself, it's about 300 linear feet of material in the special collection of Columbia University. That's everything plus about 1,500 photographs. I say about 1,500 because we really don't know exactly how many there are. There is an official count, but as we started digging into it for the project, it ended up creeping up and creeping up and creeping up. I think the official count was 1,386 or 1,336, and there have been bunches we found in folders that extend that a little further out. There are also about 43 entities that created them, including some famous names you see, Jacob Reese, uh, Louis Hine, and uh, many unfamous names, like Hiram Myers, who ends up being a fantastic photographer, I'll talk about him, as well as almost 700 that are unknown. So it's this gigantic body of work um, that was very valuable from the 1880s to the 1930s. Let me show you some of them and you tell me. Um, that's a pretty iconic photograph. It's been used quite a bit in social welfare literature. That's one by Jesse Tarbox Beals. Hiram Myers, I'm going to come back to him in a moment. Jacob Reese. The glass negatives of the Reese collection are at the Museum of the City of New York, but Community Service Society used some of these images in their, their literature. There are some illustrations, not very many, about 30. And there are a lot of street scenes which allow us to do some geographic locating. So why are they important? Um, one thing you need to know is that to get a broad-based um, digital project done in the Columbia University Libraries, you have to advocate for resources being allocated to it, right? I mean, the, the library has time, it has people, it has money. They're just not going to give it to us because we want to do this. We have to say this is important for the library's objectives, for scholarship, and for the larger community, and then we put together a collaborative project on it. So let me tell you how we did that. Um, one of the things is we looked at the strategic goals for the library, and we said, does making this collection widely accessible make sense? So we did a little presentation. I see it meets these parts of our strategic goals. 
Um, it'll certainly be easier to find the digitized photos. It'll serve an incredibly broad um, community of people who need access to these photographs from scholars. And this kind of social documentary photography, documenting the condition of the poor, is studied across the board from social work to sociology to history to art history. And people are constantly coming in to use this collection. It's one of our most used collections. And obviously, the more it gets handled, the worse it is as a special collection. So one of our arguments for digitizing it is preserving it. Right? If it's digitized, less people will be coming in and pawing through it. So that's one of the arguments. We made a whole series of arguments about serving scholarship, describing the collection. We're going to create 30 different metadata categories for each object so people will know the date, who did it, what it was used for, and things like that. So we, we made, I think, a pretty effective argument. Um, for the library, we also want to make an argument, I think it's useful, for the donor because they, they um, gave us the collection and they use the collection a lot. And if you look at Community Service Society's goals today, these are their three large goals and what they call their urban agenda. Jobs, economic security, and health care. And if you look at the things they do, this is a 2011 pamphlet from them. You'll notice that photo is in the pamphlet. Now, CSS can come to Columbia, have its digitized A photo as a TIFF, and send it to them and use it. But I'm having them all available is useful. This is also a moment where I want to acknowledge, as a historian, because I'm a historian also, that there was a whole discourse around the advisability and the inadvisability of using pictures of poor children to advocate for poor children, right? So there's a whole discourse among historians and sociologists and art historians about how problematic and, and unfortunate that is and exploitative. But among social workers and other people, they say, we like to use these photos because we are providing direct service to the poor and it motivates people to give money to programs to help the poor. Um, if you know the New York Times Neediest Cases Fund, Community Service Society is one of the top seven recipients and donors of money from them. So from a library perspective, from an intellectual perspective, we had a conference around this whole issue and it was wonderful. But from the library's perspective, we want to make this material available and our patrons can use it as they see fit to criticize the notion of this kind of social documentary photography or to use it for other purposes. But our goal is to make it widely available. So let me talk about the process. This is another man uh, from the old man's toy shop. Um, Community Service Society has approached us over a number of years to talk about the collection, how they could use the collection, how it would serve their needs. And so we started having this conversation among us about, isn't it interesting, there's a donor that gave us this collection, it's widely used, it would be widely used more if it were digitized, it serves their needs, it would serve our needs, and, and it all came together that we decided to, um, to, to go forward with the project. We scoped it out, tried to count the number of items, um, determine the existing metadata, what we had typed up in our finding aid and elsewhere, and then what kind of metadata we would have to create. Copyright, that uh, bugbear of libraries. Kenny Cruz is not here. Oh my God. <laughs> Just pretend like I'm going to give you some advice. Um, so this is a big issue, right? We're talking about. Um, um, making this material broadly available on the web. So the copyright issues of 43 different named entities and one unknown is an issue for us. How we got to that point was with Kenny's help. Um, I want to talk to him. Before we could get the project approved as a collaborative project, we had to start working with Kenny to figure this out. Conservation, wiki, and workflow I'll talk about in a minute. So um, I am not a copyright attorney, but I learned a hell of a lot from Kenny about how to think about this material, what pre-1923 is in the public domain, what is not in the public domain. There was a whole host of research done in 1991 before the web was a really useful tool for research about copyright issues. And what we found out was the vast majority of objects are in the public domain because of publication, and those that weren't were uh, created as what's called work for hire for the Community Service Society. That means they paid people to go and take the pictures to use in their publications to advocate for the poor. That's incredibly important for libraries because that means that the Community Service Society can give us the right to use them, or at least not disacknowledge that we think their rights works for hire. So with those two hurdles out of the way, most of them are in the public domain, the rest are works for hire, Community Service Society said, yeah, please go ahead and do this. We support it fully. Um, and we got to that point. I want to um, show you something. I don't know if you've seen this yet. This is pretty interesting. I teach a course in. Um, I call memory and narrative, where students use primary source collections. I tell them to use various genealogical databases. So one of the ways, again, I'm not advising you as a lawyer, just, I'm just a historian, that um, we look at figuring out work for hires, who did the photograph and who they were. So on Ancestry.com is Hiram Myers' draft card from 1917. 
Hiram Myers, the photographer who did some of those early photographs, two things I point out. There's an arrow for his name. This is his occupation, social worker. This is where he worked, Association for Improving the Condition of the Poor. It doesn't prove anything, but it builds a case that these people who took the photographs, in some cases, were employed by the entity that asked them to take the photographs. It builds a case for work for hire and just stumbled across it because a researcher from Spain came in and she was saying, I saw all these wonderful photographs by this guy, Hiram Myers. No one knows who he is. It's true. You go to Eastman House, they have no idea who he is. So you go to Ancestry.com, of course. They digitize everything in the world. You type his name and boom, his draft card is up there. So it's a useful tool in many ways. Now, we could probably do it for some of the other photographers in there, but I haven't done it. Okay. I'll talk about the workflow a bit. Um, my colleagues told me to keep it high level and not bore you to death. <laughs> we match the photographs with the existing metadata. We transcribe it into an interface that I'm going to show you, which is really unique and interesting. We ran it by conservation to check out which photographs need conservation access. We scan the photographs. We, the libraries, our collaborative effort. Um, we scan these typed information sheets that the Community Service Society 20, 30, 40 years ago typed up to go with many of the photographs, OCR'd those and put that in the database. Um, Expert metadata people created um, structured metadata around the data we, we didn't have, but they figured out from the photos. We did quality control. We are rehousing all the material now in the archives, so people can still use it, but at least each photograph will get its own little sleeve and folder, and then we're going to make it public, not yet. So that's the, the basic workflow. There are millions of subcategories in the workflow. Um, if you ever want to see the workflow plan, I'd be happy to share it with you. Um, let me say a few words about metadata. Where's uh, Melanie? That's metadata right there. This photo is actually called, you know what the title of this is? Graffiti and Little Boy. <laughs> now, now, speaking of metadata, um, some of the photos come with a title that was written on the back. I'll show you some of these. Some of them come with a title that was assigned when it was published in a community service society pamphlet or newsletter or annual report. Some of them have no titles. We're assigning a title to each of them. I'm not sure whether we assigned this one or that was in there. I have to figure that one out. Um, but it's important to the patrons to know um, the metadata, right? It's less important to community service society necessarily if they want to use a photo in a brochure who did it. But for scholars and researchers, they want to know who created it, what the date was, where was it, who's in the photo in some cases. And so we're endeavoring to do that. And that's what makes it valuable. That's the value add to just scanning the photos and putting them up and saying, why don't you crowdsource if that's your dad? It's different. We're expertly applying these categories to the photos. Um, we created a data dictionary of about um, 30 different metadata items. We took existing metadata in the archive. The finding aid has some. There are nine binders of these typed sheets I talked about. And then um, there are occasional annotations directly on the photo. A graduate student took that data and entered it into the administrative interface. That's stage one, before the photos are even sent down for scanning. Stage two is um, that my colleagues in bibliographic control, or I keep forgetting the name, so I'm going to forget it now. Um, using uh, Library of Congress controlled vocabularies, did extensive work in figuring out what other categories we can assign to each of the photos. Uh, subject access, geographic access, all sorts of things. And I'm going to show you each a couple of examples to give you an idea of what we're creating with this. Um, we had some date issues, which my colleagues wanted me to bring up as well. Um, there are the display dates, the I legible dates, 1919, where we know for sure, approximately 1919, that's how it will appear, between 1900 and 1919. And then there's the dates, the structured form dates for searching. Um, again, if you want to use the photo to advocate for the poor, it may not matter to you what the date is. It's just, oh my God, a poor child with crutches. That's one use. If you want to use it for scholarship and know Hiram Myers did these photos between 1917 and 1918, in this part of the Lower East Side, you want to know the dates. Um, and again, that's the value add that no crowdsourcing is going to do for you. Um, we had a lot of other challenges going along. Um, these are some of them. I'm not going to go too much into them, but the raw OCR had to be scanned, right? And then it had to be corrected. Um, we had to figure out what the, how we were going to formulate titles for photographs. You know, what are we going to say? How many mother, how, not to assume that someone's a mother and child because it's a woman and a child sitting together. If you have a lot of pictures with woman and child, you have to describe each one differently so each photograph has a unique um, title. Um, we had to create transcription rules because the back of each photograph has different stuff written on it, not just sticky black glue, but um, stamps of the photographic um, entity, the creator that did it, 
uh, various descriptions of the photographs, strange numbers. We had to figure all that out and dump it into the, um, into the database. And then the publication format, what's it going to look like? Oh, sorry, the publication format would be if it appeared in a community service society um, publication, what format do we use to cite that publication? There's a dispute between, the, I'm just pretending to be a librarian, the academic in me about, well, bibliographic citation, where I come from a bibliography and academic paper looks like this, and librarian saying, no, 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 bibliographic, it should look like this. So we come to some useful um, collaboration that gives us the term. Um, this is the administrative interface. I'm going to take you in and show you some things. Okay, so let me show you how, um, how we manage the items. That's interesting. Why doesn't it appear so the photos appear on here? Like that part's cut off. <laughs> no, it's over to here. It should be, it should be over here. I'll go in there anyway. There's usually a little thumbnail of the photo in there. Okay, so you go into each item, and here's how it appears. You can see the, um, the metadata categories. This is the photo you saw, the um, Jesse Tarbucks Beals child's in the photograph. That's the front, that's the back. These are all the categories. The top stuff is pulled directly from the metadata we have in RBML. The graduate student types it in and enters it in. It's interesting because there are 30 metadata items, let's say 1,500 photographs, that's what, 45,000 items? So for me, I come from a corporate environment, a 1% error rate is perfectly fine, but my friends in the library said, no way, you can't have a 1% error rate. Everything's got to be absolutely correct. So we've had to go back and correct a lot of things. Thank God, I've been helping out to correct a lot of things um, in here. But let me show you, for example, what the student's working with. There's the photo, you can enlarge it. You can look at the back, right? So it identifies the creator in this case, gives it a number. Many of the photos had their own assigned numbers by the CSS, we don't know why or how, but they all have an assigned number, we're capturing that as well. You can see the structured metadata down the bottom. The stuff in the middle right here, this stuff is all on the typed sheet that was OCR, scanned and OCR'd and put in here. So now a researcher can come in, well, let me go, let me go. I mean, a researcher can see all this information. I'll go, in, I'll go into how they use it in a moment. Um, there they are. That's how it really appears. Da -da -da. Um, let me show you something else. How about this, which Stuart did? Ran some software which went through all the photos, pulled out the faces for each of the photos and put them up there. And then you can go to a photo. Who do you want? How about that guy? And find out where it is. So assuming you're interested in genealogical information about your relatives on the Lower East Side, I should point out the vast majority of these photographs are white, working poor on the Lower East Side of New York from the you know, late 1880s through the 1930s, the vast majority. There are some African Americans from the 19, late 1920s around Columbus Circle, the San Juan Hill area, but that, that's the vast majority of, of the photographs. So you can pull out individual faces, assuming you want to do that. Um, we have term frequency lists that go to creators. These are some of them. That go to the topic subjects. When I was trying to figure out how am I going to represent metadata, what could I use? I looked through my list. Da, 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 da. Look at that. Graffiti. That could work. And I pulled that photo out. So if you want to search by category, you can do that. By subject name, by geographic subjects. Um, so it's a quite robust and interesting administrative interface. This is not, though, to be clear, what it's going to look like for the end user. We're still working on that. But it really allows us from anywhere to manage the items, right? The student can be typing in the data in one part of the library. Other colleagues can be scanning the information. I can be working from home looking at correcting data. We can all be working in this one space at the same time, saving time and money to get it done. Right now we're up to uh, 800 some odd, I think. 912. So you can see these are 
the data is typed in here, but the images have not been scanned because it's kind of a rolling process, right? You type in the data, you scan some later, you type in more data, you scan some after that. So I really like the interface for working with it. I think it's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, boy, I'm speaking too fast. Crazy New York, <laughs> whipped through my presentation. No one likes a, yeah, all right, let's see, where am I? So let me just go back here. Da -da -da -da. Okay, enlighten me, where's my presentation? Aha, uh -huh, uh -huh. uh -huh. okay, da -da -da. current slide, okay. I just took some screenshots in case it didn't work. Okay, what's the user experience going to be, as we used to say in business? What's the patron going to see when she goes there? We don't know yet. We know it's going to be easy to use. They're going to be able to search by all sorts of different categories like creator, boy, school, girl, mother, graffiti. We know they're going to be able to download not very low resolution, decent resolution items to use them. And we know there's going to be some narrative introduction to the text at the front of it. It's going to make, I think, our job serving patrons much, much easier because we can direct them to the site. It's going to make researchers access incredibly easy. The scholar in Spain, I can write her and say, by the way, go in here. You can find all the Hiram Myers photos now from where you are. It does everything that digitization is supposed to do in an effective, interesting way. And um, I think it's, it's, it's a pretty great project. So I always close with, this is my collaborators from the library. Hope I didn't miss anyone. And I close with questions. God, it was under 30 minutes. My God, I got to slow down. Questions, questions. Hi, I was wondering which software you used and do people have the capability to zoom in on a photograph? So um, we're not gonna have JPEG 2000s but because we have, uh, the JPEGs that we have now are so large that you really can get a lot of detail so we won't have that type of like a zoomify. I'm, I'm sorry, and the software other question was, was question. We, we, it was all, we, we built everything we, we did locally. Yeah, we built the software in-house. I don't think it's that complex, is it? We should license it and make some money, for God's sake. How many of these people are actually identifi uh, identified? I'm thinking That's about a great question. How many of them are identified in the photos? Because I'm thinking about, you, about crowdsourcing. Yeah. Well, once it's up there, we certainly could provide something for people to comment on them. Very few of them are identified, but there are some photos on which names are written like a Baldassi family, Hester Street is written on them, but very, very few of them. It's usually mother and child, mother at dental clinic, child at dental clinic, nurses at Columbus Circle. Very few, I would say way less than 1%, right? I mean, I mean. That's a few other social worker. Yeah. I just wanted to know if you're using EAD to to use, to change it into a markup extensible, I mean, to change it into a mark record so that you could put them on. The okay, wait. Sorry, Jocelyn. <laughs> and now for your answer. We actually use uh, MARTs for most of our digital collections as a metadata schema of choice. So EID is used for the finding aids for that level of description, but for the item level description, we use mods. This is the same administrative interface we use for the Lundsfest, right? Lindquist. Um, hi. Uh, is there any concern about interoperability with other sort of annotated sets of historical photographs that are out there or, or under creation? I mean, so a couple of things. One is there is part of the administrative interface allows you to search the web for other photographs, for matches, which seems to have worked well and then poorly recently. So there is that. But I don't know if we've thought further about what interoperability would mean. That's why we're using controlled vocabularies that are also used in other collections so that that will make it easier to search across at some point if we make it available that way. Thank you very much. Now our next speakers are um, 
Heather Saunders and Ryan Taylor from University of Toronto and SUNY Purchase. And they're going to talk about the art and environment of embedded li librarianship. Um, I'm Heather Saunders, and this is Ryan Taylor. And um, we're going to speak to you about a collaboration that took place about a year and a half ago at Purchase College, which is a state university of New York campus in Westchester County. And uh, <clears throat> pardon me. At the time, I was working as art librarian. Uh, currently, I work in Canada as a controlled vocabulary specialist, and Ryan continues to work in uh, natural sciences at Purchase College. And uh, just to jump in, uh, embedded librarianship is a hot term that's being tossed around these days, and frequently it's in the context of teaching. Technically, you can be an embedded librarian by, for example, attending faculty meetings uh, for departments. Uh, but generally, that term gets used in the context of education, and that's the context that we'll be discussing it as well. And our hope is that by revisiting this experience today in the context of some of the recent scholarship that we might be able to put together some ideas that you might implement on your own campus and uh, see what works for you and what wouldn't work for you necessarily. So this is an overview of what we'll be going through today. And, uh, We'll be discussing the needs and opportunities to have embedded librarians on campuses and uh, how you might go about doing that and what the pros and cons are of having an embedded librarian. Okay, and as, uh, as Heather said, I'm, I'm the token non-librarian of this team. Uh, so I'm a little out of my element here. I'm also on sabbatical this semester, so I'm a little out of my element for speaking a little bit too. So, so forgive me a little bit here. Um, but I am an environmental scientist. And as an environmental scientist, I see the world a certain way. The way I see the world is very simplistic. I see the world is made up of an abiotic component that is, consists of matter and consists of energy. And I see the world consisting of a biotic component, the living things that are part of our environment. And in my worldview, I also see things that humans do that can cause life to be harmed and things that humans can do that can cause life to be restored. That's the way I see the world. I, I don't see the world in terms of vocabulary that we've been talking about. <laughs> and these Mark and Adas and I, I'm sorry. This is the way I see the world. And it is a little abstract still, uh, and it is a little simplistic and reductionist. I admit that. Um, so I don't try to teach this in my intro to environmental science class alone. I do reference the science literature and try to get these concepts to make sense and stick, the term we call stickiness, sticky information uh, as a science educator. How do we get this to stick with our students? And I am advised from the science literature to try and give these students, to do to students what I've done with this particular one here, where I try to give them hands-on experience, let them collect their own actual data, and to do it by all means in the real world that this is stuff that is supposed to make science, especially environmental science, make more sense to students. The problem is I still have a fair percentage of my students who still just don't get it. Uh, and I don't think it's so much a problem with my students as much as it is a problem with our methodology in the environmental sciences, or at least in science education. That when we try to apply a science education model to environmental sciences, it's a little incomplete because environmental science is dealing with that human dimension. What is it that's causing humans uh, as a society to harm their environment? And what is the cultural ramifications of living in a harmed environment? That these are things that sitting there with an instrument at a table next to a lake is never going to help you answer. And so there are things about an environmental issue that are a little more complex that deals with humans' relationships. And so if you look in the current environmental education literature, there winds up being quite a bit being written currently, and it didn't used to always be there, about the idea of could we use art? Could we use art to help educate students? Could art help make the information more sticky? Because artists have a long history of helping explain things uh, that are complex, that are about relationships, um, and that wind up being things um, that allow us to see the unseen. Uh, you have aha moments when you experience art. You understand something in a deeper level. Now, I can go out and I can teach students about air, uh, air currents, and that, that's, that some air currents are very small and don't produce very much energy. Some air currents are very large. 
and therefore do have a lot of energy in them. And I can do that with a little mini wind turbine or show them images of giant wind turbines, or I can take them out to see a couple of kinetic sculptures. One by George Rickey that operates uh, and will move and change shape and form in interesting ways if the wind blows very lightly. Or I can take them to see an artwork by Mark de Sivero, who his works will move and bow and change direction and shape and form if the wind blows very largely. And the idea is, if I show this to students, as opposed to some abstract windmill somewhere, some scientific instrument, they might get they might get it a little bit better. It might stick with them a little bit more. So that's just one example. There's all kinds of examples where there are artists who intentionally go out and work with natural materials and are trying to draw their, their uh, patrons' attention towards things like natural processes. Now, uh, Ricky and DeSivero are not necessarily doing that so much. They're, they're, not, they're not trying to illuminate nature's forces as much as they are trying to show how their sculptures can jump and, and live. But there are some artists who really do take that, the environment into consideration with their works. And there are artists whose works are not environmental in nature, but they place them in the environment. And you can see things like how contrasting human development can be to nature. Uh, what the contrast can be just by seeing these non-natural features and how much larger than life and out of scale with nature human actions can be. And hopefully that makes it make a little, makes it stay with students a little more if they see the message this way as opposed to just trying to see it through a scientific lens. Likewise, it can give them an idea of what the future is was possible to give them ideas to see forms that they aren't used to seeing in ways to see and envision a potential new future. So this is the hope. This is the idea that's coming out of environmental literature. Let's be more transdisciplinary. Let's, do, let's be more collaborative. Let's bring people from the arts in to help us understand the sciences a little bit better. So I thought, well, let's jump on board with this and let's create a, uh, a unit for my Intro to Environmental Science course. Uh, which is a gen ed satisfier for science that would have a section, just one unit on environmental art. And thought, well, I would give this a try. Uh, the problem is I am also not only not a librarian, I am not an artist, nor do I know much about art, really. Uh, but as a scientist, I know to do research. And when I do research, I go to my library. And when I go to my library, I seek help from my librarian. So I contacted my subject specialist, who is the environmental studies librarian. And I asked, I asked uh, Leah Masser, I asked her if she could help me. And Leah ultimately referred me to Heather. So I'm gonna turn the talk over to Heather here for a little bit. I'm just laying the groundwork for why we started working together. So there's a little bit more to this story. Uh, Leah is both the science subject specialist and the head of reference at Purchase College. And uh, so she certainly goes the extra mile for trying to make a reference interview go really, really well. And uh, she knew at the time that I was covering uh, the visual resources department as well as um, being art librarian. There was a maternity leave at the time. And so I was the logical person to go to to help find uh, art images for a natural sciences professor. Um, but one of the things that came up sort of serendipitously, she was searching for journal articles as some background context and ended up tripping across a profile I had written a few years back about uh, two environmental artists. And this caused her to realize that even within our small group of librarians who ate lunch together every day and collaborated on projects, we didn't even necessarily know what our own um, our own strengths were, what all of our resources were within our own tiny little group. And as a result of that, we started going for coffee once a month uh, exclusively to talk about what we were doing professionally so that everyone knew what their collective worth was. Because I think if you want to collaborate with your colleagues, you really want to make it worth their while, so you need to communicate your worth, but you need to um, communicate your own worth to your immediate colleagues in your library to kind of get past those barriers and embed yourself. This one up from my back um. to this one? Yeah, okay. So as you can see, 
with Heather, you get a little more than I was bargaining for. I was going to the library just looking for someone who's a little flexible, who can provide me some library support on doing some research on some images, uh, and I wound up getting someone who had a lot more to offer. And I'm sure that's going to be the case of everybody in this room, that we're multidimensional people uh, to the T, and every one of us can probably do more than what actually is written somewhere in the brief description of, I am such and such subject librarian. Everyone knows what that means, and we can go on. Um, so. After we put together this, uh, this one unit, and Heather helped me put this unit together, uh, we presented it, and I'll be darned if it didn't work. Uh, it wound up being a huge success, which was good because Purchase College, for those of you who know, this ha do, does have a, uh, an art reputation. Um, and, and we do have sort of that, that vibe on campus and an interest of our students. And they really were, were very positively uh, reviewed that part of our, of our class. Um, so shortly after that class was done, um, the next semester, a couple of things happened on campus. One of the things happened was the administration announced that our annual, our annual theme for the next year was going to be about the environment. Environment is everything. And I was just like, yes, I've come to the right place. This is a great school. They, they really value the right things. Well, so they, uh, uh, they created this theme for the next year, and what, basically they want everyone on campus to try to come up with some way to tie into the campus theme. The other thing that happened was our provost uh, decided that, that he wanted to make a priority of, of collaboration, and he wanted it to be interdisciplinary. So he was really focusing on getting faculty, uh, professors especially, to work across campus and other disciplines to put together co-developed, co-taught, cross-disciplinary courses. And that was sort of an, uh, a goal. And so we put together this Topol grant uh, uh, program. It was an internal to the college competitive grant where a couple of faculty could work together, design a interdisciplinary course, and the, uh, the college would produce some funding to allow us to, to, to spend a little time in the summer to develop that course and to provide some additional support for our, for our course expenses. Now, some colleges, and I don't necessarily have these same sort of internal financial problems, but I can't hide purchase, or at least SUNY's financial problems from anybody, uh, especially given the, the writings that are in the newspaper these days. So to have a grant that was supporting this particular program was very enticing. Uh, so Heather and I were both new to the college, um, were both uh, eager to make our mark on the campus, and we had worked together pretty well to develop one unit. So I thought to myself, I wonder if Heather would be interested in embedding herself in my class and, and coming and being a, a partner with me in developing a Topol grant uh, so we could see if we could put together an interdisciplinary course. So, so I came to Heather with this particular proposal. So here are some factors to consider. Um, my impulse generally when I have an opportunity is say yes now and figure out the details later. But it's probably a good idea to consider some of the factors. So first of all, um, how high profile is the collaboration that you are able to uh, dive into? If you do one shot uh, bibliographic construction session and it doesn't go well, maybe you've got a migraine, no one's going to hear about it because no one's going to bother talking about it. But if it's an entire course, people will be watching. So that's one factor to consider. Secondly, administrative support. So Ryan mentioned that we certainly had um, reason to believe that our, our provost would be excited about it and consequently the library director as well. Um, we were both on tenure tracks and so it really made sense to collaborate. And um, I think that the collaboration is the key component of uh, this type of endeavor. And, um, pardon me, uh, we also had the advantage of, because we knew that the campus theme was environment is everything, the library was anticipating more research in this area. And so we started to bolster our collection accordingly. And um, this offset one of the potential frustrations that's been identified for embedded librarians, which is not having a sufficient collection to um, enhance that collaboration. Uh, next up is uh, track record. It, do you have a track record to build off of? So in our case, we did have this one uh, isolated lecture that we could use as a model. And in our case, we're hoping that if you haven't tried anything like this, perhaps today's session might inform the direction you might take and uh, act as a jumping off point. And lastly, is there someone you can trust? 
So uh, today's a classic example. I'm recovering from laryngitis and Ryan, I needed to be able to trust him that if I was sick and delayed in Canada, he could step in and speak as a librarian in a librarian symposium and I knew that he would pull through. And likewise, he would need to trust that if I couldn't make it, I would keep the lines of communication open constantly. So I think this is a classic example of needing to have absolute trust with the person that you're collaborating with. So um, here we are in our overview. I'll just flip past this, that's okay. Um, so here we are, my weaknesses. So I'd never taught a university class before, uh, aside from doing bibliographic instruction classes, um, but it seemed like an exciting opportunity. Um, I'm not an environmentalist, although I had taken a few, <laughs> pardon me, a few environmental studies courses, and there were certainly time constraints. Um, that was probably the biggest challenge. My home unit was very supportive. Our library director was really excited and thought this was a great opportunity, um, but he certainly, um, let the responsibility rest with me, um, saying, you know, let me, let me know what you need from me. And sometimes it's hard to ask for help if you don't know exactly what you need. So, for example, we had um, my colleagues filling in for me at the reference desk uh, because it's taking you away from the front lines, but you really need to be communicating with your colleagues why you need them to fill in for you and how it's benefiting the profile of the library in general and not just you as a, you know, tenure track faculty member who's, you know, just trying to look after their own needs. So I think it's really important to uh, communicate with your colleagues so that it seems like a shared endeavor and not just something that one person is doing in terms of those time constraints. And also, um, I was unable to get uh, compensatory pay to develop the course throughout the summer, which meant that Ryan did a lot of the heavy lifting with the course preparations. And while this disparity does reflect a lot of the uh, embedded librarianship teaching that currently exists, it's not really the model that we were after. We were really searching for more of a co-instructional model. So in terms of answering the knock, um, Carson and Neil, pardon me, suggest that you accept the risk, move outside your comfort zone, and act outside the box. And certainly that's what this endeavor represented. So the idea of the class, when we go from this, when we go from this one unit component to a, uh, a, a core science class, to change this into a full uh, semester-long class, um, what we were doing was we were wanting to teach about environmental concepts, but we didn't want students to research the environment. We wanted students to research artists. We wanted them to research their works. And that's nothing I am capable of doing which is why I really needed someone in the class who could help students research art and to, and to do it from the perspective of, of, the, of the collections that we had available and to help use the resources, especially the electronic resources that we had on campus. And so we needed someone to, I needed someone to help me do that part of the class, research art to understand the environment. And when we put this class together, it was clear that this was going to require a lot of work on, the half, on behalf of, of Heather as, as the librarian, an equal amount of work, even, even though, uh, uh, as, as she mentioned, she wasn't uh, able to receive the, uh, the total compensation for the summer for the course development. She, when it came time to putting the class together, she we were going to be side by, side by side and shoulder to shoulder in the, in the trenches on this class. So we wanted to make very clear to everyone that we were co-equals on this. So when we came time to listing the course with the registrar and, and making everything available to, to the students and, and, and to the administration, that it was clear we were jointly instructing this course, that we were equals um, in, in our eyes to each other, in the administration's eyes, and in the eyes of the students. The idea there being that, that if, we are, if we are true partners, equal partners in this, that, that we will be able to collaborate together and be able to work in a, in a very uh, meaningful and constructive way. So the way this wound up working, so we're gonna get into some of the logistics of this now. Uh, should you decide to get into doing a, uh, uh, a collaborative project with someone in this sort of embedded way? The way this worked was uh, I would be responsible for the environmental literature. Because I had been teaching courses at the school, I was also responsible for anything that looked like paperwork. 
uh, you know, especially we uh, organizing class field trips. So we're taking students off site. We're trying to get uh, guest uh, artists, try to get them a, an honorarium paid. We're trying to get uh, make sure that, that, that the faculty and students and the visual arts side of our campus are aware of what we're doing in this class. A, that it's an option for their students, but B, that, 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 that we're having guest speakers and things that are open to them to, for them to come and visit. Um, and, to, and for putting together the course and, and administering it through Moodle, which is our course software, the equivalent to Blackboard uh, a lot of places. So that would be the stuff that I would handle. And interestingly, we uh, went for an even split for the readings, um, pretty much half environmental content, half art content, to really give them a balance to not make it um, biased towards one subject or the other. Uh, I also made gallery recommendations. So uh, Ryan was the one who headed up these uh, excursions to very large, literally large field trips where they'd be out walking for hours on the grass looking at sculptures. But I directed the students to smaller venues, uh, smaller galleries in New York City and uh, local areas where they could go and comment on the exhibition. And we'd already worked on uh, writing critical analyses of uh, still images of artwork. And so then it was a great move to go from that to a gallery environment and use those same skills. And then once they were comfortable with that, once they'd been interacting with curators at galleries, they were ready to curate their own show. So we had the students create a gallery show of um, art made from recycled materials. We'll show you some images in a minute. And that was in the library. And uh, that necessitated having a liaison because we didn't want our library director to be surprised by all of a sudden there's students patching up the walls or you know doing something strange, climbing up on you know little areas to try to fit in sculptures and what's going on. So um, I was the liaison for that. And uh, probably the most overt uh, librarian role I had in this capacity was helping the students to navigate through um, the classroom management software. But otherwise, I didn't really um, have a really forceful approach to, it, it was almost like I was more there as a subject specialist who happened to be their co-instructor and who happened to also work at the library, but I don't think that the students necessarily saw me as a librarian who's sitting in on the class, uh, which I think worked well. I think it felt a little more natural. So the rest of the logistics were more or less how we would put a unit together. How would we work? That's, our, that's sort of like how the students saw uh, division of, of labor. This is sort of behind the scenes on how we would develop a unit. And so one of the things that, that we would do is I would come up, I would, I would comb through the environmental literature and I would come up with at least a couple of artists who are working with an environmental issue that I, that I would like for the students to better understand. And I would kick those artists over to Heather. Do you want to, okay, do you want to do yeah, sure, okay. sorry. And then uh, I would um, look for images that would be sort of the, the key images from those artists, the famous ones or the ones that really encapsulate encapsulated an idea, and uh, then we would kind of fine-tune the list of artists that would be appropriate for the lecture. Right, so Heather would expand the list. She would give me more options than I knew were available, and then she would give me their whole bodies of work, or at least large portions of their bodies of work. I would then go through that and think about the environmental issue I wanted to focus on for the day. What is this environmental topic? And an artist might produce a whole bunch of, a whole, a whole huge body of work, talk, spanning a whole bunch of subjects. And so we would call out those ones that were specific and would kind of revolve around this one issue for the day. Um, and so we'd, I'd say, okay, just these. Let's talk about just these. And I, and I could see like the heart crushing of, of true art historians and art librarians. What are you doing? What are you doing? You're taking this, but I was talking about the environment, so I felt I had license there. And so I'd say, let's just let's just focus on this, um, and then and then Heather would then take that. Do you want me to just do this part? Yes. Since you're, okay. yes. Heather Heather would uh, Heather would take it and would sort of construct a historical timeline. She she would try to piece back the fabric that I had ripped completely out of it. All right, so that there was context for the students. And the idea of this was that in the lectures that we would give them. A concept. Here's environmental concept. Here are some artists. Here are some key sentinel works on this. Now, during the class, you spend some time 
looking up the rest of that artist's work. You research more about this artist, find out more about what they're doing, find out more about their work, and we would do that in the classroom with Heather's sort of guidance on looking for these kinds of things. Um, so, so just sort of like pulling back, the, making it a skeleton so the students could flesh it back out again was sort of the idea. So I would then take Heather's back reconstructed thing and I would put it back together into, a, into an organized lecture and, and then we would roll with it, sort of doing like we're doing here today, each of us sort of handing off part of the lecture and covering the next part kind of thing. Okay, so my initial involvement with the course really did just start with image research and it kind of went from there. Um, it was basically a matter of translating library science as uh, worded by Carson and Neil to uh, the disciplines of environmental science and art history. And this uh, reinforced my role as provider of in-depth research, as Oliveris calls it. But this role really did evolve quickly. Um, once Ryan learned more about my background, working in galleries and my master's in art history, it made sense to kind of pull from where we could to make it the richest course possible. And that reflects Shoemaker and Talley's observation that embedded librarians tend to have a background in the subject matter that's important to their customer group. And um, because they suggest that embedded librarianship should be um, customer-centric, not library-centric, I move beyond the image research and uh, into more theoretical research without forcing an agenda of information literacy. So it seemed more important to make it a really rich art experience, or probably from my side of things I saw it as an art experience and your side maybe an environmental experience, than for me to be functioning as a really obvious librarian. Sorry, this is me again. Um, in the year two, pardon me. In the year 2000, Raspa and Ward envisioned a world where novel instructional pairings and collaborations between members of the academic community will be commonplace. And yet, even a decade later, it seems that embedded librarianship is uh, outside of the um, the targeted work plan of a lot of librarians. And what results from that is that it's hard to manage all of your responsibilities. So of course, it's great to be embedded in somebody's classroom, but you still have your normal obligations like sitting the reference desk or um, in my case, I was also covering a maternity leave. Uh, so you still have all these things that are going on. And I think part of the challenge is that there's sort of a gray zone uh, where librarians exist. Um, in our case, our library director would sort of jokingly refer to the um, trying to think how it was phrased again. I think it was the teaching faculty and the non-teaching faculty is what the majority of the campus referred to. So he would talk about the librarian and non-librarian faculty, and kind of to get into the politics of, you know, where do librarians exist and can they be valued in this kind of encounter? And um, so fortunately, our administration was really supportive. Um, but uh, we did have a number of challenges. So for example, um, I have a 12 month, or I had, pardon me, a 12 month appointment, and Ryan had a nine month appointment. Um, so that would interfere with uh, when you start planning the course, the summertime, for example, when people might be busier um, you know, out in the water taking samples than preparing a course, because that's their, um, their obligation for the school with their contract. And um, different tenure standards. Uh, fortunately, it was seen as a positive move for me to try this type of thing, but still there were certainly workload expectations um, that I really did need to rely on Ryan to do the heavy lifting because it was hard to get away as much as I would have liked to have gotten away to work on the course. Yeah, and one of the, one of the, uh, um, uh, wound up being sort of a technical issue with the tenure standards was because this was a, a co-instructed course, we only had one, still only had one course evaluation, um, which says evaluate your instructor uh, and, and not two, not evaluate Heather, then evaluate Ryan. It was evaluate your instructor. Uh, and as a, as a tenure track uh, professor, those, those evaluations are very, very important. So we were, so we made, we had to wind up making clear for students that 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 the the teacher evaluations were not going to factor into Heather's tenure uh, consideration. They were going to factor into mine. So when you do this, fill it out for me. Uh, and so there wasn't an opportunity to fill it out a separate type of thing for Heather. Um, and so that was sort of as one of those situations where we tried the best we darn could to make this equal. And then when it came down to evaluating it, we. You know, we either we dropped the ball or we just couldn't do it one way or the other. And so that's, that's sort of just something I wanted to highlight uh, to, to keep you guys uh, abreast of how that kind of worked out there. Um, do you want to do this part or do you want me to do this? Okay, all right. 
So one of the things that we were really excited about was that there was kind of a dual model of uh, embeddedness. So usually when you hear of embedded librarians, the librarian is taken out of the library and um, is in another classroom or somewhere outside the library. That's sort of the, the key component. In our case, we actually had the course within the library. And uh, so that offered, um, it was really exciting because it would mean that students would be closer to the reference desk and uh, studies showed that there tends to be an increase in reference questions when you have embedded librarians and uh, the students would be walking past the reference desk um, as they exited, it was the only path out of the library or when they were done class, if they wanted to check out a book on an artist that they just learned about, they had that opportunity. So it was really a chance to welcome inactive library users. And uh, so that was quite exciting. So very similar to Columbia's layout, you know, with the libraries being right in the center of campus. Uh, our library also is in the center of campus. We only think, only real difference, I'm not, and I'm being a little tongue in cheek, is we just have one uh, library. Uh, and, and it's, and it's quite a bit smaller. Uh, but, but on our campus, you know, we've got the natural science side of the campus, and then we've got the artist side of the campus. And never the twain shall meet, right? <laughs> Uh, so where can you find uh, common ground for the for the for, for for everyone? Right in the middle, right, right in the library, right in this neutral ground, this this place where everyone can get together and everyone can can feel like this is this is theirs. Everyone has their own ownership over this, and this is from the student's perspective, right? Like I'm never going to walk into that science class. That's why I came into that science building. That's why I came to purchase. Or I'm never going over to that art side. I, I'm a scientist, darn it. So. So the idea that, okay, we'll put this in the middle, you know, sort of had common ground for the students, but also from a, a college politics sort of side of things, you're not going to have the scientist come into your art building and teach an art class, are you? I mean, who is he, you know, to be able to do that? Or worse, how, could, how dare he have it in the science building where we can't keep an eye on it? Uh, so put it in the library, that way everyone can see it and it's right there and everyone can feel like it's all, all, all something they have ownership. Wound up being a, sort of a, a, a very useful tactic for us. Um, and I'll give you this sort of layout of our library a little bit here. Um, this isn't all the library, but this is sort of the central floor of the library. Um, and when it came time to doing the class, um, you can see that nothing in here is listed as an actual lecture hall or, or true classroom. Uh, the best we had were these computer labs, um, which actually worked well for us uh, because we wanted students researching more about the, the artists as we talked about them. We wanted them to get online. So we chose one of the computer labs to be our classroom. And we're not the kind of college that encourages everyone or requires everyone to have a laptop, that kind of thing. So to have a class with students having the omnipresent internet right in front of them, between you and them, uh, is sort of a, a big deal. <laughs> so, but we wanted that to happen so we could say, here is a particular artist, visit their website and look at some more of their work. Um, so that was something that, we, that, that wound up working very well for us. Um, the other thing, when we had visiting artists, you can imagine a visiting artist would not really want to exhibit their art in a computer lab as they're coming to talk about their methods. But we did have a very nice reference uh, room, which did, which did have kind of the dark woods and the very kind of a nice arrangement. And, and, and we would invite the public to come see these, uh, these speakers, and they would come there, not in our computer lab, to come talk. And that wound up working out very well for us. Um, but then the third part of the class, or maybe it's the fourth part or fifth at this point in time, uh, of the class was we wanted the students to make their art, to do an art exhibit and have a place to exhibit the work. Again, not very good exhibition places in the natural sciences building. Is it really artists' work to be in the visual arts building? Uh, maybe we can do it in the library. And the library does have a number of places where they do exhibit spaces. They do have exhibition places. But we were able to kind of, through Heather's liaisoning, was able to sort of smooth out a, our own little corner of, a, uh, of the uh, lobby area, interior lobby area, to host our exhibition, where then the, the trash, the actual name of the exhibit, was able to get a lot, of, uh, a lot of view and a lot of profile right where it was where people could, could, could see it. 
So this was really exciting. It really was the, the highlight of the course, I think, for a, a number of students, they mentioned this. Um, they'd spent the semester learning about art, and many of them weren't from a studio background. Very few of them were. Um, but they really, I think, by the time they got excited about art and then got to the end of the semester, they were comfortable picking a theme together. They chose uh, trash as their theme. And um, these are a few of the works here. One is uh, all uh, pop bottles or soda bottles, pardon me. And the, the middle one is very meditative. It's um, rolled up newspaper, so about recycling. And the one on the right is all cigarette butts. I think hundreds of them that were picked up on campus. And uh, this is one of the ones that we actually contained in a display case just to um, contain the smell. We actually had someone... <laughs> One of our librarians was pregnant at the time, and so there's all sorts of factors. You think you've, you've thought of everything, and then you know there's someone who's pregnant who's reacting to a gigantic cigarette. Um, but this is the kind of work that the students came up with. They were so proud, and I really think that there was a lot of activism as well as aesthetics, which was great. And um, the image on the left here shows that the students had stacked up furniture to have more uh, novel display units. And on the right-hand side, we've got the library director as well as the director of environmental studies and uh, one of the students. And uh, we also had some money in our budget for uh, a reception, so we've got some food here, and uh, we had flyers, and it was a little down to the wire. I had um, coached the students on all of the steps that are involved in putting on an exhibition, and it wasn't until just the last minute, the you know, crack of dawn, that they really started printing the flyers and you know, getting excited about the food and inviting their friends. But it all came together just at the last minute, which was amazing. And, and you can imagine from the perspective of the library director, oh, you're going to have this art class, and they're going to make art out of trash they're digging out of the dumpsters, and they're going to plaster it all over the walls. Great. Great. So I mean, we had a real opportunity to fall totally flat on our face in a lot of ways with this class, and one of them was hinging on these non-art students making good art that is a benefit to the library, right? That would help the library bring people to it and make it a space that folks would want to come into. And sorry, I also forgot to mention that the uh, show was launched on Earth Day and ran until graduation. So it was a really great time to a uh, very high profile in terms of having more people in the library than usual. This was actually around the time that the library introduced its 24-7 uh, or maybe 24-5 hours uh, during exam periods. Students would be with their sleeping bags and their you know, kettle of tea. And so we really did get a lot of people viewing the show, which is great. Um, this is just a, a quick slide to show you the artist in residence for the visual arts program, Christine Lee. She was working with uh, repurposed materials as uh, our campus was being renovated. And she built these modular benches, which is great because the students were actually involved with a student library advisory committee on um, giving us ideas about what they would like to see for furniture. And so when Christine Lee uh, left campus, when she finished her residency, the library director um, consulted with me about adding them to the library, which may have happened without this entire um, endeavor. But, you know, maybe, maybe he consulted with me because he saw our exhibition planning prowess or whatever. Uh, but the point is that today these remain part of the library. So even though the trash works are no longer there, there's still sort of a component of that. Okay, and just to conclude, um, Melville Dewey stated, the time is when a library is a school and the librarian is in the highest sense a teacher. And the course that we taught at Purchase College, we believe demonstrates the library's capacity to function as a classroom, as well as the ability of a librarian to act as a co-instructor. And that it really does represent the, the fruits that can come from combining your efforts with your colleagues. Ultimately, the course was deemed successful by the administrators and by our respective colleagues, but most importantly, by the students. So uh, fortunately, in those evaluations that Ryan mentioned, uh, they did go above and beyond just commenting on Ryan and kind of commented on the overall dynamic by saying that they thought the collaboration between a professor and a librarian made the class atmosphere more dynamic. And really, that's, that's all the encouragement you need is just one comment like that to know that it was worthwhile. As Shoemaker notes, the task of developing the embedded librarian's role is not finished. In keeping with Heider's last of 10 tips for successfully embedding yourself, we took the time to engage in some professional development at the end of all of this. So we traveled to um, Toronto, Canada to be part of the Arts for Social and Environmental Justice Symposium, and it was a really great chance to reflect on how everything had gone and what we might do differently in the future, and to talk to other people from other schools about what they thought about our project. And uh, hopefully that's sort of what we're doing here as well today. Uh, pardon me. And it, 
this is noted that it's um, this step is often missed in embedded librarianship. So we highly encourage you that if you do uh, embark on embedded librarianship, take the time to kind of plan out some of the administrative challenges beforehand, but also give yourself an opportunity to reflect on it afterwards. And, um, and we hope that if you do work with mixed programs, uh, different dif disciplines like natural sciences and art, that you might consider embedding some courses in the library and not just bringing librarians outside of the library. Thank you. Yeah, Ryan, is there an alternative course that you or someone else teaches at it, um, SUNY Purchase which discusses either the political or the technical aspects of environmental science? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Bruce. Yeah, um, is there an, an alternative course that either you or someone else at Purchase teaches discussing the technical or political aspects of environmental science? Well, we, te we, we teach a number of classes in our, in our program. Um, that th th There's a policy course uh, that focuses solely on environmental policy. Then there are more technical classes like regulations. There are ecology courses, human ecology. I mean, we, we, we have very specific classes that wind up being um, single discipline though and this was the we we do have a few that are cross-disciplinary like environmental journalism where where one of the professors uh, dr kramer teaches it with a with a with a journalist professor um so uh, and then and then the art and the environment course um and then we're, we're developing an art history course as well that'll be a co-instructed course so we do have some courses that are co-taught with other faculty um and but we do have multiple environmental courses that students take where they deal with different issues around the environment. Does that? Yeah. Okay. All right. This isn't the only environmental course we have. Do you have any suggestions for doing outreach with faculty? Because typically at the campus I'm at, we don't have many faculty coming to the library and saying, could you take over half of my course? Um, so <laughs> what, what tips do you have for doing outreach? Is that for you, Heather? I don't know if that's for you. This might be a question for me. I guess it might be sort of a, a vague answer, but I think finding a way to communicate your willingness and your worth. I guess in my situation, um, I kind of had a, another embedded librarianship opportunity, which was sitting on a board of study, uh, which is kind of like in a department. And I think if you can be out there and in a completely different context from what you're actually after, so say I was taking minutes in faculty meetings, but at least it got me in touch with my colleagues. And so I think if I'd tried to broach something like this with one of them, it would have I would have had a better shot at it from, I guess, doing them a favor. Um, but I think that's probably something that we still need to think about. I guess, I guess getting, getting the hypothetical support of a library director in advance so that if you're in a conversation with somebody, you can let them know that the opportunity exists. Uh, I guess it would be very risky to um, kind of indicate your willingness and then find out that you don't have the resources to support you while you're actually trying to make it happen. Yeah, and I, I think if there's anything I can add to that, it's, it's the fact that we were in two different programs or two different specializations to where the need wasn't necessarily coming to Heather where she might have thought the need would come from. That she wasn't com someone wasn't coming to her from the art history or the visual arts lab faculty, but it was coming from someone on the outside. Uh, where you know, if you think about it, I'm the one who needed the help the most for for her, uh, not so much for for a classroom instruction. So that's that's the other thing I think is to think about where your radar is is aimed for looking at opportunities coming. Uh, hi, thank you for your presentation. It's a great example of. Uh, an academic co collaboration with the library and an academic department. I'm just wondering if it was just a one-off or has it inspired other courses like this at, at SUNY Purchase or is there now a, a place in your library for an academic department to have a, a sort of a foothold? Uh, 
there's uh, I guess there's a few things wrapped in that. Uh, the, the the library does house some other sort of like they have the they have a, a writing center where the creative writing department has has a, a group of visiting uh, writers come and they and they and they work there uh, helping students do writing. And so there's a couple of other circumstances like that that happen on campus, um, along with like digital media. They have a whole digital media zone there that's, that's all set up for, for, for uh, the visual arts folks to come in there and do their class instruction in the library as a part of that and, and for that to be available studio space for the students uh, in the visual arts department. Now in terms of has the school uh, pursued other uh, embedded librarianship arrangements like what Heather and I have had, I, I don't know that that's happened any place else yet. Um, but I know that this particular visual arts kind of idea, environmental idea, is evolving more and that we're going to be doing more of that kind of thing, whether it or not involves the library, I, I, I don't know. Actually, I'll just add to that. Um, I, my understanding was that um, the director was open to it. I, I know that part of the reason I wasn't able to get compensatory pay was because um, the attitude was, well, what if other librarians want to jump on board and they also want to teach? How will we budget for this? So that indicated that there's an openness to it, but it would be up to the individual librarians with their own workload and their own goals. But your question raises an interesting point. There was another librarian at the school at the time who was amazingly outgoing with her faculty, and she was part of a sort of unofficial embedded librarianship um, endeavor, she sat in on at least half of the classes and co-wrote an article with an instructor. But because it was never formalized, I don't think that it gained the recognition that it deserved. So um, it's kind of a tangent, but I would recommend that if you do anything that um, kind of falls into this territory, if there's a way that you can make it formal and recognized, it's, it's worthwhile um, for your own documentation, for other people to support you, um, just in general. <laughs>